Hello and welcome to My Career in Data, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to Doug Laney from West Monroe. More and more companies are considering investing in data literacy education, but still have questions about its value, purpose, and how to get the ball rolling. Introducing the newest monthly webinar series from Dataversity, Elevating Enterprise Data Literacy, where we discuss the landscape of data literacy and answer your burning questions. Learn more about this new series and register for free at dataversity.net. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity and this is My Career in Data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management, to understand how they got there and to be talking with people who help make those careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Today, we are joined by Doug Laney, the Innovation Fellow and data of Data and Analytics Strategy at West Monroe. And normally, this is where our podcast host would read a short bio, I guess, but in this podcast, your bio is what we're here to talk about. Doug, <laughs> hello and welcome. Hi, Shannon. Great to be with you. Likewise. Well. Likewise. Very well. And you? Very well. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for being a longtime Dataversity friend. No new and met you at many conferences and you're a speaker coming up at Enterprise Data World. I am looking forward to it. Yeah, we'll be Me. covering monetizing uh, data as a, as an asset and a little bit mm-hmm. about data and analytics maturity as well. Oh, very cool. I love that. So tell me, uh, you're the innovation fellow of data and analytics strategy at West Monroe. So mm-hmm. first, tell me about West Monroe. What is it? What's the company do? Yeah, so West Monroe is a digital services firm um, that kind of brings together technology-related expertise and business-related expertise. Um, about 2,500 consultants focused mainly on North America, although we've been recently uh, winning some projects uh, across the pond. So that's good. Maybe maybe we'll be expanding over there beyond our, our London office, which focuses mainly on M&A activity. Um, so yeah, uh, we, we cover most um, most industries. And uh, kind of again bring together uh, data and technical, uh, uh, technical and uh, industry expertise for our our, our our clients. We don't do time and materials type work. Um, it's very mainly project work and um, uh, deep relationships with the clients. Very nice. Mm-hmm. So, what is it you do for West Monroe? What's your typical week look like? Yeah, so as an innovation fellow, my role is has really got three components. One is doing market facing things like um, you know instructing at, at data diversity and, and speaking at events, and uh, I publish in in uh, in Forbes and in CDO magazine and elsewhere. Um, I also work to develop new innovative offerings for West Monroe. So one of those that's now a core offering of ours is uh, uh, data monetization. Um, strategy and approach. So we help organizations um, design, conceive and design and develop and implement data products or even set up data um, data product functions within their organization. Um, we also do some data evaluation work um, and we help organizations evolve to becoming more data driven by um, really managing data as an actual, actual asset. So um, I participate as a senior data strategist on engagements. I develop new offerings and then I do these market facing activities. Oh, very cool. Mm-hmm. So so tell me, Doug, so I've known you a while and you're actually really well known. I don't know if you know this, but you're really well known in the community. You, you <laughs> I'm <laughs> sure you, <laughs> you were very popular. So, but, so is this- You're gonna make me blush. <laughs> <laughs> is this what you wanted to be when you grew up, when you were just, you know, six years old? It was just the dream. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I was probably about the time I was six or seven years old, um, yeah. I wanted to be a photographer. Oh. Um, my father and I built a dark room in the basement and uh-huh. uh, used to uh, shoot and develop photos. And um, I would spend two, three, four nights a week sometimes in the in the dark room, wow. um, experimenting with different techniques or whatever, and just kind of learning the learning the trade. Um, <laughs> smelling all those chemicals must have done something to me, huh? <laughs> <laughs> So, um, 
but then my when I was 13, my dad brought home a uh, a, a personal computer, and I found mm -hmm. it to be a much more powerful creativity tool, and pretty much never stepped foot in the dark room uh, again. Um, wow. So yeah, it was a it was a real quick shift. Uh, learned to 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 uh, to code and experiment around with the with the PC and um, yeah, so that was kind of my journey. And then um, you know, you talk about being known in the in the industry. I remember sitting around in university with with friends, and um, everyone was like, "What do you want to be when you grow up? Oh, I want to be rich. I want to be famous. Oh, blah blah blah." And we're like, you know what? I just want to be respected in my profession, whatever. And um, so uh, yeah, that's. I love that. So what yeah. did you end up majoring in? Well, there's a story. <laughs> How much time do we have? So I'll, I'll tell you the story. So originally I was a math computer science major at University uh -huh. of Illinois. And I got into differential equations in my second or third year. Um, and, uh, and the first day of class, the professor grabs a handful of chalk. And it's one of those old classrooms with the, the chalkboards that slide left and right and up and down, right? Yeah. <clears throat> um, like in goodwill hunting right yeah. and um and he, he spends 30 minutes just writing this these formulas or just scribbling on all the all the chalkboards and we're all looking at each other in the class going what the heck is this and finally he turns around he says does anybody know what this is and we're like we have no idea so we start guessing any kind of what's called an np complete problem an unsolvable problem so we were guessing mm -hmm. fermat's last theorem and traveling salesman problem and he's like no 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 because this is the proof to the four color map problem so cartographers have always known you only needed four colors to color a map with no two borders you know this, this touching yeah. the same colors um it was considered to be an unsolvable proof until this guy proved it in like 1968 or whatever and interestingly um you can look this up on wikipedia uh, professor apple um did this and, and it's the first proof that was validated by computer which is interesting <laughs> So I was in very intimidated and I'm like, is it too late to drop this class? And I was really more interested yeah. in the business aspects of computing. But back in, this is 1984, at University of Illinois, there was no MIS degree. Mm -hmm. So I created a uh, individual plans of study program, um, submitted it to the committee um, that integrated business and, and computer science, and it was unanimously rejected. Wow. Um, they su suggesting that... Um, um, why would anybody ever want to use computers for business? <laughs> so <Wow. laughs> um, anyway, a dean ended up helping me get it pushed through. And so I ended up getting a degree in software engineering and business administration. And then I learned that the next year they they used that um, that curriculum as the basis for a full-time MIS program at Illinois. Oh, that's yeah. amazing. And now I'm honored to teach there. So I, I teach my infonomics MBA class there each year. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, that's come, that's come, very cool. Coming full circle then. Come full circle, yeah. Yeah. True innovator. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so where'd you go from there? What's the first job out of college? So the first job was with, uh, talk, talk about coming full circle, was with Arthur Anderson back uh, when it was Anderson Consulting, before uh -huh. it was Accenture. And, um, and, and interestingly, Wes Monroe, who I'm with now, was sort of born from the ashes of Arthur Anderson, Mm -hmm. After the Enron scandal, when Arthur Anderson kind of blew up, yeah. um, they had a, a business consulting group and four people from that practice formed West Monroe 21 years ago. Wow. So it's kind of like coming for full circle for me working uh, at West Monroe. Very cool. Yeah. So how did you go get from there to uh, West Monroe? Well, I guess the quick story is uh, uh, five years at, at Arthur Anderson building batch uh, data architecture. Uh, data architectures mostly i'm um, working on methodologies um, i ended up going into the expert systems world because i had an interest in ai so i joined mm -hmm. some early stage ai companies back in the late 80s early 90s working with natural language query and forward and backward chaining algorithms and crazy stuff like that um, and then i followed a colleague over to a company called prism solutions formed by a lot of your listeners will know bill the name bill inman Mm -hmm. the father of the data warehouse concept. So he hired me to run the consulting practice in the Midwest and then in uh, Australia, we moved there for a while. Um, and uh, and yeah, and then uh, I was remember I was speaking at an event, um, um, was it was like, it, was, it wasn't Dataverse, it was a DCI event. Mm -hmm. And someone from Gartner heard me talking about uh, data warehouse methodology. We had built the industry's first data warehouse development methodology while at Prism uh, called Iterations, which 
In fact, uh, IBM used for about 25 years after they acquired Prism. And um, I was speaking on, on the topic and somebody from Gartner came up, actually it was Meta Group back then, came up and mm -hmm. said, hey, did you uh, create those slides yourself? And I said, well, yeah, why? He said, do you want a job with Meta Group? I'm like, well, <laughs> sure. <laughs> so <laughs> moved back to the US, joined Meta Group. Meta was then reacquired into Gartner uh, late, yeah. later on. And, um, and then I went back to Gartner after doing some other things for a while and pretty much spent, spent the bulk of my career as a senior analyst with Gartner, helping to set up the uh, chief data officer um, research um, group. And um, yeah. You mentioned that you um, you built uh, data architect or data architects for, uh, mm -hmm. for, for the initial company. Where did you learn that? Did you learn that as part of your degree? Did you make that up? Like, you, you just, like how did you figure out how to do that? You know, my degree was, was not, as vocational, not as uh, vocational as a lot of other degrees. There was a lot of theory um, mm -hmm. at University of Illinois. Yeah, we learned to code and program and all that, but it was very much more theoretical. So we learned a lot about relational, um, the relational databases and the theory right. behind them, and that translated really well into uh, everything, including data warehousing. Mm -hmm. I like it. So. So Doug, what was the biggest lesson so far in your career that you use maybe daily or five? Um, well, my father was a, it was an engineer, a world class engineer, several patents to his name, and mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, you know when I started messing around with the with the PC, um, he said you know it's good to know how to program, but you know that may only take you so far. He said you know you really need to learn to speak and write, and that's what's held held him back in his career. And mm -hmm. so I really focused on my writing and and uh, and speaking. Um, the speaking kind of happened um, accidentally. I I um, got a job um, as a as a comedian, <laughs> as a stand-up oh. comedian at university, um, yeah. kind of accidentally, and I uh, took that uh, did that for several years. So that got me really comfortable, you know, talking in front of any size crowd, whether they're throwing tomatoes at me or not. <laughs> but yeah, I think the big lesson from my father, you know, was, was to you know, learn to speak and write, and that might, that will take me further than, you know, just learning to, to code. Um, and then I think more recently, it's been about uh, building a personal brand using social media and networking mm -hmm. and, um, and, and then connecting my brand to the companies I'm with, whether it's Gartner or, or West Monroe. So I think everybody today should be thinking about you know, how to, how to build their own, their own personal brand. Networking is so important. Mm -hmm. And those soft skills, like you say, like, and, um, and I don't want to say that writing is a soft skill necessarily, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, but speaking, and I love that you're a comedian. I didn't know that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I bet that what, what was the difference between the first time you got on stage and, and at the end? As a comedian? Yeah. Well, I just did my little five minute act and then it, it led to uh, being asked to MC at a club at a couple of clubs and yeah. Um, yeah. And then I actually at, at Arthur Anderson, my manager caught wind that I was doing stand up on the side, just, just, you know, open mics and things like that. And mm -hmm. uh, back in the days when we, we could only wear white shirts and had to wear your jackets in the elevator. And uh, yeah. he said, listen, that this is this hobby of yours is unbecoming of a young consulting professional. And I was dissuaded from continuing. Oh, but yet it served such a good purpose in being able to communicate. It did. It did. Yeah. Visit dataversity.net and expand your knowledge with thousands of articles and blogs written by industry experts, plus free live and on-demand webinars covering the complete data management spectrum. While you're there, subscribe to the weekly newsletter so you'll never miss a beat. That's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. So, um, so tell me, having worked with data for so long, you know, what's your definition of data and how do you work <laughs> with it? Oh, wow. Definition of data. I, I guess it's just a digital representation of something, an event or an observation or, um, or, or an entity of, of some kind, I guess that's a little technical, but it's, it's really just a, a digital representation of, of something, right? Yeah. So yeah. how do you work with data in your current role? Um, really, really, most of my work is around helping organizations generate ideas for creating new value streams from their existing data assets. And it's really been kind of a, 
a focus or a journey of mine since I first kind of came up with the infonomics idea, this idea that, that information is an actual asset. And started mm-hmm. thinking about, all right, well, what do we do with assets? Well, we, we, we manage them, right? We measure them and we, we monetize them or generate value from them. So a lot of my work really has been around helping companies move beyond just building pretty pie charts and bouncy bar charts and dashing dashboards to, to really put data to, to work build data products from it that others can use and um, do things that are much more, you know, diagnostic and predictive or prescriptive with their, with their data and and help them come up with those ideas. You know, when I rejoined Gartner, they said, um, you know, Hey, Doug, you're the, you know, you're the big data guy. You came up with the three V's of big data. Right. And, uh, and so we want you to, you know, cover that for our clients. And the, the questions initially were around what is big data, you know, back in the, um, was, you know, uh, around 2010 or so. And, and then the questions quickly turned to, um, you know, how do we do big data? And then what do we do with all this big data? Which led me to start collecting use cases on how organizations are using data in innovative and, and high value ways. And that really inspired me as well. And, you know, a dozen use cases and stories turned into 50, turned into 500 plus stories. Um, that it used to inspire clients to to do more with their data than just report on it, right? Um, yeah. And then I was uh, compelled um, or cajoled by some colleagues to uh, put this into a book. So my latest book after Infonomics is called Data Juice. And that's uh, a compilation of 101 stories of how organizations are squeezing value from, from data. So- Oh, um, exciting. Yeah, so that's really what my focus is on, not anything too technical, but really, mm-hmm. Uh, helping business leaders and data leaders um, do more with their their data assets. Okay, so I have to ask, what's your favorite story in the book? Do you have one? Oh, I got to remember which one is in the book. Ah, there are all sorts of just <laughs> great examples. I, I remember yeah. this. Uh, well, here's one that I actually inspired. Um, I was speaking at a conference on, on, and I was talking about dark data. And then mm-hmm. someone in the audience raised his hand and he said, well, what dark data could we possibly have? And of course, dark data is data that's unused or underutilized data. And I said, well, you're, you're with, uh, he was with one of the big four consulting firms. And I said, well, your, your goal is to run successful projects. Um, have you ever thought about analyzing the project communications on projects to identify where there are issues, leading, issue, you know, leading mm-hmm. indicators of issues on projects like scope or budget or personnel mm-hmm. or technology related issues? Um, and um, someone uh, in the audience, lo and behold, t- went and took that idea, um, someone from, from Lockheed Martin. And uh-huh. so he actually spoke at a Gartner event several years ago showing how they analyze project communications and other documentation to get leading indicators of project issues well before the traditional method of typing up status reports, right? And sending them upward and then aggregating them and so forth. So right. they they claim they have three times greater foresight into project issues now and are saving hundreds of millions of dollars a year on the wow. product line where they've they've applied this. So that's one of my favorite stories because it's one that I, I think I inspired, so. <laughs> oh, I love that story. Yeah. That's uh, I have a lot of practical reasons or use of cases for that. Mm-hmm. Um, for sure. Wow. So then do you see the importance of data management and the number of jobs working with data increasing or decreasing over the next 10 years and why? Yeah, probably increasing uh, commensurate with the, the, you know, the volume and velocity and variety of data that we mm-hmm. see out there, plus the drive by organizations to leverage their data more than they already are. Mm-hmm. And layer on top of that, um, the, the new wave of AI and generative AI, which puts even more importance um, and value on a company's data assets. Um, I also think that, and I wrote about this in Infonomics, I think that many organizations treat data as kind of a second class, um, second class citizen. Um, they, they talk about uh, data as an asset, but they don't really manage it with the same discipline as other assets, as their financial assets or their physical assets, or even their human capital. And, and it may be because it's not a balance sheet asset. Um, and until the accounting profession recognizes data as a balance sheet asset, I think uh, it, it, it's gonna be difficult um, you know, to, to, for many organizations to rise to that level of managing and 
measuring their data as an actual asset, but I think there's an imperative to, to do so. Um, and especially with um, the, this new wave of AI, uh, partic in particular, unstructured data is really coming to the fore. Very nice. So yeah. then what would advice would you get uh, give to people looking to get into a career in data management? Yeah, again, there, there's always going to be room for people who are technical and, you know, learn how to, you know, set up, you know, databases and data structures and do data modeling and handle master data management and implement data quality functions and, and all of that. Um, but I, I think um, there's a lot of value in, in people who are able to connect the dots between um, data and, and business value. And there's, there's still a big gap there, uh, I think. Um, we often refer to it as, as data literacy, but I think it's more than just literacy. It's really getting organizations to treat data as an actual corporate asset, not just talk about it like one. And uh, whatever kind of role that takes or what kind of roles that takes to help an organization get there, um, I think those are going to be the ones that are really important. One, one example would be, um, you know, most organizations have an entire department dedicated to procuring office supplies, right? But they don't have a single person dedicated to procuring data supplies. You know, they're only thinking about data within their own four walls and not really recognizing that there's this wealth of ex external data out there. Or maybe they're, they're aware and they go to a data broker or, uh, or a data marketplace, but they don't really have a defined function dedicated to identifying potentially valuable data and determining how to license it and integrate it and, and, and leverage it. So that's, you know, we talk about the data scientist being the sexiest job of the 21st century. Yeah. I think it, I think a data curator or, or something like that is, is important, if not uh, equally important, if not sexy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love it. That's really, really good advice um, and, and very great that it's so important. So, yeah. you know, um, Doug, I would be remiss if I didn't ask how people would find uh, you at West Monroe or look up West Monroe. Oh, yeah. We're just at uh, westmonroe.com. We actually had to buy that URL from a, a, a town in Louisiana or Mississippi, I think. I forget where what, oh. I think Louisiana. <laughs> so we, we bought the URL from them um, a few years ago. Um, so it's westmonroe.com and everybody can find me on, on LinkedIn. Um, um, uh, and uh, I usually post everything that I post on LinkedIn. I usually put the hashtag infonomics. Um, so if you don't want to follow me, you can follow my content on infonomics. I also publish in, uh, in Forbes and, and CDO magazine and elsewhere. I love that. So how many books have you written? Oh, so, um, yeah, two and a half. <laughs> so, um, we we published yeah. a book while I was at Gartner on big data. Um, it was mm -hmm. an ebook through the Financial Times, and then I published Infonomics on my own after that. And then um, last summer, published Data Juice. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, even though my wife told me if I ever wrote another book, it would have to be titled "How I Use Big Data to Find My Next Wife." Um, <laughs> I am now working on a third book. Oh no! So, I give my <laughs> my MBA students, uh, uh, um, uh, an assignment to pick any yeah. economic model and apply it to data yeah, and uh, explore, does it, does it work? Would they revise it? How would business and data leaders actually use that, that economic concept like supply and demand or productivity frontiers or marginal utility? And so I have, I have uh, hundreds of papers from students and I'm thinking about how to compile those into, wow. into, a, into the next book on, um, that really gets into the economics of, of information. Oh, I love that. We get to that question all the time. How do you, how do you monetize it? How do you show the value? How do you create that ROI, for, mm -hmm. especially for the jobs um, needed to, to manage the data? For sure. It's a great place to be, great, a great time to be in, in mm -hmm. uh, data and information. And if uh, somebody wanted to find your books, um, they... they're all oh, uh, uh, you know, online booksellers, Amazon, Walmart, whoever. Yeah. Perfect. Well, actually, uh, Data Juice is only available on Amazon. Yeah, I self published that one. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Um, and a little bit more about Infonomics and the, the book there. We talked yeah, about the, the story of well... Data Juice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Infonomics I published while I was at, uh, at Gartner, and it's about how to monetize, manage, and measure data as an actual corporate asset. So it's kind of three books in one. 
and, and then you're... data juice is the um, is meant to be meant to it's 101 stories of how organizations are using data in innovative ways or squeezing value from data in innovate innovative ways and um, or high value ways and most of them have a value proposition uh, associated with it so the, that book is meant to really inspire or or, or shame <laughs> organizations into <laughs> doing more with their their data than than just again reporting on it very nice. Well, Doug, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Thanks, Shannon. Real pleasure. We'll, oh. we'll see you at uh, upcoming events. Yeah, yeah. I'll see you in Anaheim and uh, any plans to go to Disney World or Disneyland. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what ride are we going to go on together? I don't know. We got to think about it. <laughs> I'm too sharp for roller coasters. <laughs> are you? Right. I, I meet the height limit, but barely. Right. And there's like a foot between me and the top of the uh, shoulder pad. So like, it's so scary. Like, I, I feel like want... I'm going to fall out every... <laughs> they will go on some kitty rides then. Yeah, exactly. Probably all that, that makes... my inner, inner ear can handle anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Well, Doug, thank you so much. And we'll make sure and get all those uh, links posted to the page when it gets thank published. You. So, and for all of our listeners out there, if you'd like to keep up to date in the latest podcast and the latest in data management education, you may go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Until next time. Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks, a podcast brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Thank you.